All right, good morning. Uh, we will uh, continue in our study in the book of Acts. We will be this morning in, the, in Acts chapter 9. We're going to take a look at verses 19 through 31. And uh, just continuing in the uh, uh, telling of, of the conversion of Saul, who later became the Apostle Paul. Uh, as we last looked at this, we ended in the beginning of verse 19, but we looked at the situation where uh, after the, uh, the companions of Saul had led him to, back to Damascus and found him a place to stay and just kind of led him there. And, and Scripture tells us that uh, he was there for three days. He didn't eat. He didn't drink. And uh, later on, we see that he was praying. And then down in uh, verses 10 through 19, we saw that uh, while, uh, the, uh, while Saul was uh, in Damascus in this house or wherever he, w wherever he was and on the straight called street, the house of Judas, that uh, he was praying. And he had seen in a vision a man named Ananias come and lay his hands on him and that his uh, eyes would be opened, he would be able to see again. So while he's praying, we see that uh, the Lord is dealing uh, with another guy, this Ananias. And uh, it's an interesting story as we looked at that and we read about that. And, and uh, it tells us in verse 10 of chapter 9 of the book of Acts that uh, there was a disciple named Ananias in Damascus. And the Lord said to him, um, Ananias. And he said, he was quick to answer, here I am, Lord. And then the Lord tells him what he wants him to do. He wants, to, he wants him to go and uh, see this guy, look for this guy named Saul. And he wants him to go lay hands on him. Uh, so that he can recover his sight. And Ananias had, uh, had had a little bit of issue with that. He said, uh, hang on a minute, Lord. I, I've, I've heard about this guy because Saul's reputation and the, the destruction that he had been causing, the havoc that he had been wreaking in the, in the church in Jerusalem had gone out. The, the, the word had gotten out. And, and uh, Ananias had said, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much, he, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord quickly stopped him and said, Go, uh, for he is my chosen, he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. And so we see in verse 19, or verse 17, then Ananias, after that direct word from the Lord, Ananias uh, obeys immediately. It says that uh, he departed, entered the house, and he laid hands on Saul. And, and I love the way that uh, the scripture describes the greeting that, uh, that he, with which he came into the house. He said, Brother Saul. And this tells us that, you know, from that word from the Lord, he, Ananias had trusted that God was with uh, Saul, that, that, uh, that he had, in fact, had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ and, and was transformed. And so when he came into the house, he greeted him such as, as a brother in Christ. And he said, Brother Saul, he said, The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and again, just imagine, and you know, not only was Ananias to lay his hands on Saul, through which, the God, through which God would work and, and uh, you know, rec recover his sight, but then he would be filled with the Holy Spirit as well and empowered for the ministry that the Lord was calling him to do. And so we see that uh, he rose and was baptized, and that the beginning of verse 19 says, And taking food, he was strengthened. And so he, uh, he ate and he gained some strength. And, and then we're going to pick up the story there with the rest of verse 19. And we're going to take this in a couple of sections. But let's look at uh, verses 19 through 22 first. And so let's read those verses. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. 
Uh, you think about this, you know, that, that uh, he spent some time for some days, it says that he spent some time with the disciples there in Damascus. And, uh, and immediately, I love this, immediately he began to proclaim Jesus as the Son of God. And think about this. Those that have been transformed by the saving grace of God cannot stop talking about it. Amen? I mean, once you've been saved and transformed by the grace of God, you can't stop talking about Him. He becomes the center of everything, and that's the way it should be. Acts chapter 4, verse 20, we see this. Uh, Peter and the other disciples said, after they had been arrested, they said this, For we cannot but speak about what we have seen and heard. We need to tell others about Jesus. We need to be like Peter and, and the other uh, disciples here. We need to be like Saul here in this uh, situation. We need to tell others about Jesus. We need to be proclaiming the gospel, the good news about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I love the fact that the scripture teaches us that immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the, in the synagogues. Um, you know, the content of that preaching was that Jesus is, in fact, the Son of God. Now, this is totally different from the message that he had been, uh, been proclaiming before that encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. Now, he's undergone a, a, a total transformation. Now, he has a new message. He, the message is, is that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. And uh, he's telling everyone about the one who changed him, Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus, the Messiah. And, and what's the result? We see here in verse 21, uh, it says, And all who heard him were amazed. You know, it's an amazing thing when the Lord, when you watch the Lord transform a heart and a life. It's an amazing thing to see uh, this guy, a terrorist, go from being a terrorist and, and, and totally against Christ and against Christians, and, and he was wreaking havoc in the church. The scripture tells us that he was, um, that he was tearing the church apart. And, and he was still breathing murderous threats uh, against the disciples, and, and he was ravaging the church. And that word ravaging literally means he was tearing the church apart, and he was arresting men, women, and he was killing them. Now, this same guy, after having an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, quite the opposite. He did a complete 180, and now he's telling everybody that will listen to him uh, that Jesus is, in fact, the Christ, that he is, in fact, the Son of God. And so what's the result? Everyone was amazed. You know, it's, again, it's truly amazing when you see the transformation. But listen... Not everybody's going to be excited about that. Not everybody's going to be on the same page as we are uh, for those of us that have come to faith in Christ. And we're excited about the transformation that has taken place. Not everybody's going to be on board with that. And not only tells us um, that they were, they were amazed, they were confounded, and, uh, but they, uh, he, was in, he went into the synagogues. Now remember... Uh, back a few chapters ago, we saw that Stephen did the exact same thing, went into the synagogues and was preaching Jesus, uh, preaching that he is the Messiah, and it angered the people in there. And it very well may have been, as we had said earlier, it very well may have been that Saul was in one of those uh, synagogues uh, and, and was debating against Stephen. And so Saul possibly may have heard the gospel from Stephen, and then Stephen was killed, was martyred, and Scripture tells us that uh, Saul gave his approval uh, of that murder. Now Saul is in the synagogues, and now he's preaching the same message that Stephen had preached, and it just astounded everybody who heard him. Um, and verse 22 tells us that uh, that Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. He proved it through the Scripture, the Old, through the Old Testament Scripture. And uh, in verse 22, that he increased all the more in strength. This seems to be a reference to spiritual strength. And so, uh, so God had uh, empowered him and given him a special empowering and enabling to 
to preach Christ to the masses, to, uh, to those in the synagogues and to those that, uh, that are listening and even those that didn't want to listen. He's preaching Christ boldly and unashamedly. And uh, the Lord had given him more and more power. He was increasing in strength and his ministry was taking off right from the, right from the beginning. Um, Acts 1.8, uh, Jesus tells the disciples and us, he, he tells the disciples in that setting, he said, go back to Jerusalem and wait for the gift of the Father. And in Acts 1.8, he says, you shall receive power. Think about this. Saul here in, in, in chapter 9, verse 22, it says that he increased all the more in strength. Jesus said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be my witness. And that's exactly what we see happening here, even with this terrorist, Saul of Tarsus. He was receiving power from the Holy Spirit to be a witness for Jesus Christ and share the good news of the gospel. And so soon Saul's ministry began to frustrate the Jews in Damascus. Look at verses 23 through verse 25. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him, but his disciples took him by night and led him down uh, through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. And so it wasn't long before the good news of the gospel began to really uh, frustrate those, uh, the Jews. And, and before long, and, and listen, just the same as with Stephen, the, the, the scripture teaches us in, in, in uh, Acts chapter uh, 6 that as he's in the synagogues and he's proclaiming Jesus and he's debating with the, with the people that are in there uh, that they couldn't withstand the wisdom and the power and the spirit of which he was speaking and how he was speaking. We see the same situation here happening with Saul that they couldn't counter his claims about Jesus, that he was proving that Jesus was the Christ through the scripture and the same thing happened they began to just like those in, um, in, in Jerusalem these religious leaders followed the lead of those in Jerusalem and they turned against the truth of God they rejected the truth of God they rejected the Holy Spirit and we're gonna see that this is gonna be the case uh, for the, the Apostle Paul, for Saul, when he becomes the Apostle Paul uh, throughout the rest of the book of Acts and all of his journeys and, and all of his, uh, his preaching, we see that he ruffles feathers and he angers people and, and, and he just rouses people up to the point where they just want to kill him. And so we see here, this is the first instance of that happening, that, that they began to be so angered that they plotted to kill him. Um, but their plot, it says, became known to Saul. The, the, think about this. The Jews plotted and planned to kill Saul, but God had another plan. Remember, when uh, God told Ananias to go and lay hands on him, he said, listen, I'm gonna, he is my chosen instrument to go and preach the gospel. And so listen, uh, no matter what others do, no matter what others plan to do. Nobody's able to do anything to the Lord's people until the Lord says so. And so the Lord protected Saul here. And we're going to see that throughout the rest of the book of Acts, we see this happening over and over and over again until God's plan and purpose for Saul was completed. Uh, so Saul, beca the plot became known to Saul. And, uh, you think about this. I mean, they were watching day and night. They were waiting at the gates for him to come in or uh, to go out, and they were going to kill him. But God, uh, and I love those, those words, but God, I love that phrase, but God. God had another plan. And so the plan became known to Saul. It became known to the disciples. And they, they then planned and took him by night and led him down through an opening in a wall. See, at that time, there were houses that were literally built on the wall. And apparently, uh, somebody that the disciples knew, one of the believers had a house or knew somebody that had a house that was right there on the wall. And so they uh, planned to uh, uh, bring him through that house, put him in a basket and lower him down in a basket in an opening 
uh, through the wall. We see here that Saul became a real basket case, and he was lowered down in this basket. Um, they took him by night and led him down through this, this wall. And listen, this truth reminds us, it reminds us that even in the midst of trials, we can still rely on and, tr and rejoice in the all-sufficient grace of God. The Holy Spirit interceded again and again and again uh, to protect Saul and again and again and again uh, until his purpose for Saul, for the Apostle Paul, was completed. Now let's look at this next section. Verses 26 through 31 we see uh, that he enters into Jerusalem. So look at verse 26. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road uh, he had seen the Lord, who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them in Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Verse 31, so, so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the com comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied, the church multiplied. So back in verse 26, we see now after uh, they lower him uh, in that basket uh, through the opening in the wall, the next verse we see is he, when he had come to Jerusalem. Now there's some debate as to when that actually happened. According to verse, uh, Galatians chapter 1, uh, verses 17 and 18, uh, there had been a, uh, a three-year time period that had elapsed uh, before he went to Jerusalem. He's, he's telling those, uh, the, the churches in Galatia, that he didn't go to Jerusalem uh, for three years, but rather he went into Arabia. And, and so there's some debate as to when that happened. Uh, some say that it was between Acts chapter 9, verses 22 and 23, where it says that he increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews, and verse 23, then they plotted to kill him. Some say that that's when he went away and then come back. Others say that it was between verses 25 and 26. They lowered him in the basket, and then he went away into Arabia, into to the desert, and then he come to Jerusalem after three years. I tend to think it's more of that one, but I'm not sure. So we can't uh, say for certain which it is. I, I, don't, I don't know. But all we do know is that according to uh, Paul's testimony here in, in Galatians, uh, that there at some point three years' time had elapsed. And think about that. During that time, uh, the Apostle Paul went, uh, spent time in, in Arabia and, and spent time with the Lord, being personally trained by the Lord Jesus Himself and received revelation from God Himself. And, and nevertheless, whenever that happened... Um, he did eventually come to Jerusalem. And so again, verse 26, when he'd come to Jerusalem, he, he attempted to join the other disciples. He, hey guys, how you doing? And they weren't having it. Again, think about who this guy was. Think about his reputation uh, that went before him. I mean, he became known throughout every place in the church. All of the Christians knew of this Saul because he was such a, a terrorist. He was killing Christians. He was intentionally seeking out to arrest, persecute, and kill Christians. And so if, I, I, it, it makes sense that everybody was afraid of him. But think about this. We know, we, we've probably seen and know people, maybe some here listening, uh, have, have been in this situation to where you were just so bad. <laughs> just so bad that your reputation preceded you and, and, and people just feared you. And they, they thought, man, this guy is just wicked. This woman is just wicked. But that, that, and that's the case here with Saul. But God, remember, but God. Saul had had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ and was transformed, totally transformed by that encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. And think about this. The disciples knew this. They knew Jesus. I mean, they had seen all of the miracles. They had seen the things that had happened. But still, still, they're, 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 they're hesitant. 
And it says that they flat out were afraid of him and they did not believe that he was a disciple. They couldn't believe that this guy, this horrible guy, this terrorist had had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ and was truly transformed. Uh, we know people like that. But listen, he was transformed. He did have an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I love verse 27. Verse 27, enter Barnabas. Barnabas, his name, is, it, it means son of encouragement. Uh, Barnabas was an encouraging guy. And Barnabas stepped up. He stepped up on behalf of Saul and interceded here. And uh, we, we see that not only did he intercede, but he, he really went to bat. He really went to bat. He, the son of encouragement, uh, Barnabas, gave Saul the reference that he needed to the other disciples. He advocated for Saul, and he described the transforming events in Saul's life. A and listen, we all need a Barnabas from time to time. And we all need to be a Barnabas from time to time. Let's take a lesson from that. Let's, let's be a Barnabas. And, and when you know, we're in need, listen, the Lord provided Barnabas. Barnabas stepped up. Barnabas, you know, he, he really just kind of put his neck on the line here and, and interceded for Saul and began to share in verse 27. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them, how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and, at, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. And so Barnabas steps up and, say, and says, listen, guys, I've seen this guy in action. I've seen him preaching boldly. I've seen him standing in the synagogues, debating with the, with the, with the religious leaders, with the Jews, and, and confounding them. And, and he truly has the Spirit of God. He's been filled with the Spirit. And I've witnessed this. And what's the result of that? Notice the next verse, verse 28. After Barnabas steps up and intervenes and, uh, uh, on behalf of, of, of Saul, Verse 28 says, So he went in and out among them in Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And so the result of that, um, Saul was then able to go in and out. What does that mean? That means that the disciples there said, Okay, okay, come on in, brother. Just like Ananias, when he walked into that house, and Ananias uh, believed God. He believed God and believed that even a terrorist, even a guy like Saul of Tarsus can be changed, can be transformed. His heart can be changed and melted and made anew. He was, in fact, a new creature in Christ. And so based on Barnabas' testimony on behalf of Saul, uh, the other disciples accepted him in as a brother in Christ. And as a result of that, he was able to go in and out among them in Jerusalem. He was able to preach boldly in the name of the Lord. Now, um, <clears throat> again, back in Galatians chapter 1, uh, uh, when Paul was recounting this time, uh, he says that he, he spent time with Peter and he spent time with James. He didn't see any of the other uh, apostles. And so the, the two apostles, Peter and James, are the ones that he had seen, he had spent time with. And uh, it, it tells us that his time uh, there in Jerusalem wasn't very long. In Galatians cha chapter 1, it was 15 days. He only spent 15 days. But just in a short amount of time, in only 15 days, he was preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And, and again, I mean, he had now the freedom to evangelize, which led him to, as we see here, dispute against the Hellenists. The Hellenists were the Greek-speaking Jews there in the synagogues and, and, and again this is these were probably the some of the same people who were with Saul possibly debating against Stephen these were some of the men that knew Saul these were some of the men that had understood what he who he was and, and what his purpose was that he was ravaging and destroying the church um, now Saul's in these synagogues now he's debating against these same people who were on his side at one point. And what happens? Just like in Damascus, what happens in Jerusalem? 
they seek to kill him. Uh, look at uh, verse 29. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. The church here back in Jerusalem soon discovers that it's almost as bad having Saul with them as it is against them because he quickly stirred up a hornet's nest. He quickly incited riots because of the truth, because of the gospel. It wasn't that Saul himself was offensive. It was that the gospel was offensive. And, and Saul goes on to write that, that it is a, an offense. The cross is an offense to those who are perishing, to those that aren't listening, to those that don't want to hear it. And so he quickly stirred up this hornet's nest and got them angered to the point now they want to kill him. And so verse 30 tells us that when his brothers learned this, when the uh, other believers there, when the disciples learned that now there's a plot to kill him, they, uh, they had this plan to bring him down to Caesarea and send him home. They sent him off to Tarsus. They figured, let's, let's get this guy out of here for his own good and for our good. He's, he's stirring up this hornet's nest. And listen, uh, we're going to go through it again. The church is going to be destroyed again from somebody else because of this guy, because of the gospel. They understood that it was because of the gospel. Um, but again, God intervened. The Holy Spirit intervened. Because God wasn't finished. God had just began to work uh, through Saul, who would again later become the Apostle Paul. And so God again intervened and got him out of there. So they had this plan. They brought him down to Caesarea and they sent him off to Tarsus. And so what's the result? After they sent him off to Tarsus, look at verse 31. Everything began to calm down again. Think about this. Think about how radical... Saul was. Think about how on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ he must have been at this point, and, and we see this throughout the rest of his life, uh, that he did not back down. He did not stop preaching the gospel. He would not shut up for anything. And, and we know, uh, again, according to what happened to the life of the Apostle Paul, we know eventually they took his life. He was martyred because of that zeal. He had the zeal and the fervor and the passion to share the Lord Jesus Christ, and he did it unashamedly. But once they had got him out of there, once they had sent him home, uh, not that they weren't continuing to share the gospel, because we're going to see here at the end of this verse that that had to have been the case, that they were continuing to share the gospel. But notice what happens. Look at verse 31. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace, had peace, and, and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. And so now the Lord had given them again another time of peace and other uh, believers were coming into the church. Other people were coming in, believing the gospel getting saved, being transformed, and the church again is growing. They experience a time uh, of peace. They experience a time of growth. Now think about this. Both the conversion of Saul and the growth of the church, they both express God's amazing grace. As we continue on in the story of the book of Acts and, and, and really the, the history of the church, the beginning of the church, we see over and over and over throughout this whole story, throughout, and we see it even today, that the grace of God is truly amazing and, and, and He continues to extend grace in the church. It doesn't mean that uh, there's not going to be persecution because there certainly is and there will be but Jesus promised that not even the gates of hell will prevail against the church and again remember gates don't move gates are are made to keep people out and the scripture Jesus said not even the gates of hell is going to keep the church from expanding not even the gates of hell is going to keep the church from growing and others coming into the fold and so as we um, 
close this uh, section of the book of Acts. We, next time we'll get into it, it, the, it, the scene shifts back to Peter, and we're going to see here for a couple of chapters, we're going to see the Apostle Peter and uh, the work that the Lord does through him and his ministry. Um, and, and then it, it, it'll really just take off with the ministry of the Apostle Paul. But again, as we finish this, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, will not keep the church from growing. And so as I close this section, I just want to again remind you that the Lord Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. He said Himself, no one comes to the Father but by me. Are you trusting the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you a part of the church through the shed blood of Christ, through trusting in His death, burial, and resurrection? If you are, praise God. If not, what are you waiting on? Let's pray. Our Father, once again, we just uh, bow before Your throne and thank You for this truth. Thank You for Your Word. Thank You for uh, the Word that is written down, the experience of the Apostle Paul uh, in the early days and and even uh, right after he began to preach that uh, he was preaching with fervor and, uh, and just sharing Jesus and sharing the gospel with such zeal that uh, it, it even angered people. Lord, not that we want to anger people, but Lord, I pray, God, that you would give us that zeal, that fervor, that desire, Lord, to... Uh, to be bold in sharing the gospel and preaching the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God will be sure to give you the praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.